for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you all. And um, I'd like to let you know that my name is Valentina Gonzalez and I'm one of the Sidelitz Education Consultants. Anna Mattis is also joining us today. She will be chatting with us in the chat feature. So if you're asking questions or collaborating, feel free to ask Anna and she'll do her best to answer your questions. Before we get started, I'd like to go over some logistics with you to help to make sure that this runs smoothly, smoothly for us this morning. So if you have been here a little bit early, you might have heard Anna Mattis mentioned that we are recording this session this morning. And so if you are a registered participant, you will receive a link with the recording as well as the slides in about 24 hours. We also want you to feel free to chat with us in the chat feature. And be sure you've indicated that you wanna chat with panelists and attendees. So sometimes people just mark panelists by accident. Um, if you want everyone who's in the webinar to see what you're typing, you wanna ensure that it also says attendees or everyone. And in addition, if there is some type of Zoom failure, meet us back on the Sidelitz Education website under the webinars tab, and we'll let you know how we're going to continue our webinar this morning. If you're on Twitter and you'd like to tweet and share out the wonderful things that Marcy Voss is sharing with us this morning, we use the hashtag Sidelitz Ed Chat. I have the great pleasure of introducing our presenter today, Marcy Voss. And I've known Marcy for quite a while now. I love Marcy dearly. I wanna let you know that Marcy Voss is a longtime educator with varied experiences in the field. She has been a classroom teacher, as well as a special programs coordinator working with GT and with English language programs. She also helped to develop and implement the two-way dual language program in her district. In addition, she is actually the author of these amazing cards that I so love. I wish I knew and had these cards when I worked at the district. They are so great. You're gonna love hearing about them and I highly recommend them. Now on a really personal note, and if you were here early for the pre-show, you might've heard Marcy mention this, but on a very personal and very important note, Marcy is a gold star mother. And today her son, Captain Mark Tyler Voss, who was lost in service for our country seven years ago, along with his crew of the Shell 77, is being honored. And Marcy, our hearts and our prayers and love go out to you and your family today more than ever. And I hope that you feel the warmth of our love surrounding you, not only during this session, but throughout the day and year. We love you so much. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Marcy. So I'm gonna let Marcy share the screen. Love you so much, Marcy. Thank you so much, Valentina. All right, um, can you um, allow me to share the screen? I am going to. Okay. There we go. Okay, well, good morning. Um, I really am excited to be here with you today. Um, well, we know that COVID-19 has certainly changed the way that we're providing instruction for our students these days. But we should remember that there are still some excellent strategies we use in face-to-face -face instruction that are be beneficial in an online setting. And one of these is sentence stems. So whether you're providing synchronous or asynchronous instruction, sentence stems can be a powerful way to help students develop academic vocabulary and literacy skills. And today I'd like to share with you uh, some of the things that I've learned about developing sentence stems that will hopefully help you do the same. 
So I will be sharing three easy steps for writing differentiated academic sentence stems. Let's begin by thinking about why it's important for English learners to speak and write in complete sentences. What are your thoughts? What have you noticed? Well, in the book, Seven Steps for Building a Language-Rich Interactive Classroom, the authors, Bill Perryman and John Seidlitz state that when students complete, can speak using complete sentences, they can think in complete thoughts. They're able to attach academic vocabulary to concepts and practice using academic language structures. And we know, of course, as students get older, their literacy skills greatly impact their ability to get into institutions of higher education, as well as to both obtain and maintain a job. But how do we do this? Well, let me tell you uh, about a time when I realized the importance of um, speaking in complete sentences and practice doing that. And I really found the answer to this question. I worked as an AL coach for several years at a middle school. And one year I worked with an eighth grade student um, in his math classroom. And what I learned was this student was very gifted in math. He was often the first one finished in doing his math problems. Yet I noticed that when he, um, when, he, when the teacher asked a question, he never volunteered an answer. Now, this teacher was a great teacher. She was kind, she was loving, very warm, um, and she was really good at teaching math. She um, was able to explain the concepts in a way that was very clear and easy for the students to understand. So it didn't really have to do with their teaching style. His silence had to do more with his um, lack of practice of academic vocabulary. So this student could have benefited from a strategy that I saw many teachers successfully use, and that is sentence stems. Sentence stems provide a variety of benefits. First of all, they help our students get started in speaking and writing without the added pressure of having to correctly formulate a response. They model the language and grammatical structures that we want our students to know and use. So if our math teachers and science teachers are using sentence stems, they're actually being literacy coaches. Sentence stems give a practice of new vocabulary in different contexts. They enable responses and complete sentences so that students can communicate complete ideas. They facilitate in, um, conversations with their peers and their teachers. They assist with both spoken and written language, and of course, increase English language proficiency. So there are many reasons why sentence stems are an excellent strategy for us to use. But maybe your classroom looks like this, and you have students with many different needs and many different language proficiency levels. So how do you create sentence stems for all of these students? Well, that's what we'll be talking about today. Our content objective for today's session is we will learn three easy steps for writing differentiated academic sentence stems by following directions to write them. And our language objective is we will write examples of differentiated academic sentence stems by using brick and mortar terms. Now, before we go on, let's take a look at some of the vocabulary I've chosen to use in these objectives. First of all, academic. What I mean by academic sentence stems is that these are stems that use the brick and mortar terms that you want your students to know and understand. And I'll be talking a little bit more about what brick and mortar terms are. I've also used the word differentiated. And what I mean by this is that we will be looking at how to write different sentence stems for different students at different language proficiency levels. So let's get started. The first step is for you to select the academic vocabulary that you want your students to know and understand. Deutro and Moran categorize academic vocabulary into brick terms and mortar terms. Take a look at the brick and the mortar terms for it, that are in this chart for algebra, English one, and biology. What do you notice about these terms? What are the differences between brick and mortar terms? Let me give you just a minute to look. Well, brick terms are the academic vocabulary that are specific to the content or discipline that you're teaching. 
So for example, if you were in a math class teaching fractions, students would need to know the words numerator and denominator. In a reading classroom, students would need to know the words character, plot, and setting. In a social studies classroom studying the Constitution, students would need to know the words preamble, bill of rights, and amendments. And in a science classroom where students were studying the rock cycle, they would need to know the words sedimentary, metamorphic, and igneous. These are the terms that are usually in the glossary in the back of textbooks. And note that we would usually not use these terms in the other discipline area. So for example, if we were studying the rock cycle, we would not be talking about numerator or denominator. So that's one way to help you identify the BRIC terms. Mortar terms, on the other hand, according to the seven step book, are general academic vocabulary terms that are used to connect the BRIC terms. So if students were comparing and contrasting, they might need to know these terms like analyze, compare, contrast, between, and therefore. If they were sequencing, they might need to know the terms first, next, and finally. And if they were having a discussion, they might need to know the words agree, disagree, because, opinion, possibility, and however. Now, unlike the brick terms, the mortar terms are used across the discipline areas. And you might have noticed that when you looked at the chart that we looked at before. So you'll note the consecutive can be used in any of those three areas, algebra, English, or biology. And you'll find that true of other mortar terms as well. So to summarize, the first step is to identify the brick and the mortar terms that you want your students to know and understand in the lesson that you are teaching. The second step is to determine the proficiency level for your students. Now states categorize um, language proficiency levels in different ways. Some have three levels, some have four, and some have five. Use the leveling system that your district has chosen to use to determine the proficiency level for your students listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Now, where can you find this information? Well, there's different places you might look. First of all, there might be an actual physical folder that you might have this information in, in your district, such as the student's permanent record file or the LPAC folder. You might also have an electronic data management system that you can use. Um, a matter of fact, I heard a presentation last week on Elevation that has a very robust um, data system that has this information and your district may have something like that. You can also find this information from people in your district, um, such as your district DL coordinator or your campus counselor. Um, but there will be many ways that you can look for this information and someone at your campus will be help, uh, helpful in getting this information for you. So to summarize, the second step is to determine the proficiency levels of your academic language learners so that you can determine the number of different sentence stems that you will need. Now, let me define what I mean by academic language learners, and I'd like to use my children as an example. Um, obviously, I'm a teacher, so my kids grew up in a home where um, actually both parents were college educated. Um, we were a middle class family, and we knew the importance of reading to our kids and helping them learn. But I will tell you that we did not sit around the dinner table talking about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So where did my children learn those terms? In their science teachers' classrooms. So even though my children were English proficient, they still were academic language learners. And in fact, all students are academic language learners. So when you're creating sentence stems, be sure to include the stem for your English proficient students as well. Normally, this is the stem or the same stem that you will be providing for your English learners who are at an advanced or advanced high proficiency level. And then you will provide additional stems according to the needs of your other EL students. And depending upon their needs, you might include one, two, or three other stems. Let's take a look at how we'll do that. That's the third step, create sentence stems. And I'm using an example from the academic language cards in um, sharing this with you. So this would be the stem that I would use for my English proficient students and my EELs at an advanced high level. 
And this is where I start. I start with the most advanced STEM first. Uh, let me show you how this example works. In this particular STEM, you would be adding the academic vocabulary that you want your, wanted your students to use, the brick terms. So using the information regarding grassland food webs found in the diagram, I can infer badgers are top producers because. So this would be a STEM that I might use in a, um, a middle school classroom, science classroom. Let me give you another example. If you were studying Charlotte's Web or having your students read Charlotte's Web, you could say this, using the information regarding Charlotte's actions found in chapter three, I can infer, and you might leave this blank because you actually might want students to make their own inferences and then get a rationale. Now, if this STEM was a little bit too advanced for um, some of my English learners, I could simplify that and um, take out the words found in blank to create this STEM. Using the information regarding blank, I can infer blank because blank. But if I had maybe intermediate students for whom that might be too difficult, I could simplify it further by taking out that introductory clause and I could simply have them respond to this sentence STEM. I can infer blank because blank. But if I had beginning students, that still might be too difficult. They may not have the vocabulary to give the rationale. So I could simplify it even further and create this sentence STEM. I can infer blank. So in this example, I showed you how you could start with your most advanced STEM for your most proficient students. And then you can simplify the STEM, the number of times that you need to do that for the proficiency level of the students that you have. Let's take a look at how this works in the classroom. Normally, we get our language objective from our content objective. And our content objective usually identifies the some of the brick uh, terms that we'll be using with our students. And actually, if you go back to your district standards or your district curriculum, you'll find that many of the brick and mortar terms that you need will be there. So we create our content objective, and then from that, we create our language objective. So let's take a look at this middle school example. The content objective has the students looking at scale factor, and the language objective says, I can tell my partner if scale factor represents an enlargement or reduction. Now notice your brick terms are scale factor, enlargement, and reduction. Your mortar term is represents. And the thinking skill that the students are using is simply identifying. They're, the teacher just wants them to tell whether the skill factor is an enlargement or reduction. So knowing those things, I can create my STEM for my most English proficient students. And this would be the STEM. The scale factor in this problem represents A or an blank because blank. But maybe I had English learners who really didn't know the rule yet for use of those articles, A and an. I wouldn't have them use that STEM. Instead, I could simplify the STEM and have them use this STEM. The scale factor in this problem represents blank. And I could give them a word bank where A and an were used correctly, an enlargement or A reduction. So just to review, I started with the content objective to create my language objective. I used the brick and mortar terms from my language objective to create my STEM for my most advanced students or most English proficient students. And then I simplified the STEM for students who are not quite that English proficient. Let's look at another example. This is from an elementary classroom uh, where the content objective has the students comparing living and non-living things. And the language objective says that students will write a sentence telling the difference between living and non-living things using the words living and non-living. So the brick terms are living and non-living and the mortar term would be different or differences. And the thinking skill really is that the students are comparing. So the stem that I could create for my most English proficient students would be two differences between living and non-living things are blank and blank. Now, if that compound sentence was a little bit difficult for some of my English learners, I could simplify it and have them look at just one difference. One way living things are different from non-living things is. So, 
Just to summarize, I start by writing a sentence stem for my most English proficient students. And that would include my English proficient uh, learners if I were in the gen ed classroom and my um, English learners that are at a high proficient or advanced high proficient level using the brick and mortar terms that I would want them to learn. Then I simplify that stem for my English learners who are at a less proficiency, advanced proficiency level. Now, let's try practicing this um, together. Let's think about what is a lesson that maybe either you've already taught or one that is upcoming. What are your lesson objectives? What is your content objective? And what is your language objective? So just think about that for just a minute. Pick a lesson. Now, within that lesson, what would be the brick and mortar terms that you want your students to know and understand? And you might want to write these down on a piece of paper, or you could even jot them down in the chat, because I think the more that we see brick and mortar terms, the easier it is for us to identify them. So let me give you just a minute to um, write down the brick and mortar terms that you would want your students to know in that particular lesson. And, and if you want to, you can maybe even call out some of the terms that you're seeing um, people write. Absolutely, I'll start asking the question and we'll see what answers we get. People are loving the cards, Marcy, big surprise. Oh, oh good. <laughs> so we'll have you talk about them a little bit at the end, I'll ask. I will. Oh, here's a good one. I can compare a nonfiction text to a fiction text. Love it. Yeah. Love it. All right. Then I would like for you to use those brick and mortar terms to write a sentence stem for your English proficient students and your ELs that are an advanced or advanced high level. And the example I've given you is the text evidence that supports my conclusion is blank. So start, and again, you may want to write this down on a piece of paper or your device, or if you wanted to, you could even put it in the chat. You want to hear yeah. some of them, Marcy? We have, yeah. I can identify cause and effect relationships, a lot Ooh. of cause and effect. We heard not, um, slope and constant. Ooh, um, love it. Isn't that a good one? Perfect. Y'all are really good at this already. All right. Now, after you write that sentence stem for your English proficient or your most proficient um, students, simplify that stem to create a second stem for less English proficient students. And the example I've given here is the text evidence is. So I took out the words that supports my conclusion. And that's usually what you'll be doing is removing uh, vocabulary from your complex stem to make it simplified. Now, as you're doing that, I'd like to share with you some tips. Um, first of all, you want to make sure that your students can pronounce the vocabulary that you're asking them to use. So have them corally read the sentence stems that you want them to use. Um, that's really important. And that would have been really important for that um, gifted math student that I had. Secondly, if you're offering more than one STEM, there's different ways to do it. And there's no one right way. Pick the way that works for you. Some options are put all of the STEMs on the board and let the students use the STEM um, for which the, uh, they feel comfortable using. Um, the danger in that is that you might have some really proficient students choose the simpler STEM. So another option is you can uh, assign STEMs to different students. And a third option is if you only have a few students that are needing a simplified STEM, you can put the more complex STEM on the board for all to see and then write the simplified STEM on an index card and hand it to the students that are needing the simplified STEM. So there's no one right way, pick what uh, works for you. A third tip that I'd like to share is we've been talking about how to differentiate stems according to language proficiency levels, but you can differentiate sentence stems in other ways as well. So for gifted students, you could incorporate higher level thinking like depth and complexity in the sentence stems to really challenge their thinking at the same time that you're getting them to practice the academic vocabulary. 
So I hope this has given you a few minutes to at least think about how you might create, uh, craft sentence stems for your students. I'd like to invite you to post your stems to this Padlet page. Um, I've included all of my examples there uh, for you to see, and I think it might help others to take a look at some um, examples as well. So if you'd like to post your um, sentence stems there and use that as a place to go and see what others have um, posted as well. So this is a great for us to share our expertise and knowledge with each other. And then finally, I'd like to leave you with some resources today. Um, the steps that we have shown you today are easy, but the practice of implementing the steps sometimes is a little more difficult or takes just a little more practice. So um, the first thing you might do is just simply Google sentence stems on the internet. There are a ton of resources out there and you might find something um, that you can just take and use. Um, Secondly, I referenced the academic language cards earlier. Um, the academic language cards contain four levels of sentence stems that are categorized around eight different language functions. And seven of the eight already focus on higher level thinking skills. So um, you can get students to really think at the higher levels at the same time that they are practicing their academic vocabulary. And the academic language cards are both in English and Spanish. And then finally, I just wanted to point out our own sweet Valentina, who very kindly introduced me today, um, has written a blog about sentence stems and sentence frames. And I've used that term sentence stems fairly generically today. So you may want to take a look at her blog where she really differentiates between those two things. So just wanted to leave you with that information um, so that you can go and find out more. And that pretty much concludes my uh, discussion today. Um, I just want to let you know that we would love to stay in touch with you. I've given you my um, personal email and you are welcome to email me. Um, I'm retired now and have time that I can work with you if you're needing additional help or at least let you bounce off ideas. So just let us know how we can help you. Uh, we really look forward to making new connections with you. And thank you. Any um, questions from the chat or anything that I need to address before we finish today, either Valentina or, or Anna? So it's funny, Marcy, I started writing in some of the questions, but you are just magic and you answered every single one. Like people would <laughs> ask and then you kind of answered. The majority of them, they, they sound very similar, but they want people wanted to know how we match our student proficiency levels to the STEMs. What's the best way to do that? But I think you really addressed it with the levels. But if you want to speak at all to the um, the selection of multiple stems, and then yep. how we know where if our students are picking the right stem to match their levels. Okay, that's a really good question because one of the things that I did not elaborate on is um, the characteristics of each proficiency level. But normally, um, the states have. Um, included that information as they give you guidance about how to categorize uh, proficiency levels. So for example, in the state of Texas, we have the English language proficiency uh, system and TELPAS, which is the way we assess their English language proficiency. And there are proficiency level descriptors that we use to determine if a student is beginning, intermediate, advanced, or advanced high. And those descriptions really tell more about what students are capable of doing at those levels. So for example, a beginning student is not able to use past tense um, correctly, ordinarily. So in my beginning stems, I never use past tense verbs. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be something you could use as guidance for helping um, either you create a term or a, excuse me, a stem that's appropriate for that student or for students to select the STEM, that would be uh, one in which they can use. Does that help? I think so, definitely. Valentina, do you have any more? I just wanted to mention that so many people wanted to know where to get the cards from. And so if you missed it in the chat, you can go to sidelineseducation.com and go under the products tab and you can find them there. What I really, really love about the cards is that they address eight different skills. So it's vocabulary and then comparison and then evidence, prediction, cause and effect, summarization, interpretation and evaluation. But then in addition to that, 
within each skill, you've got level one and level two and level three and level four. And so the cards are so much, they're really useful and they're really outlined in a way that teachers and students can use them effectively in the classroom. Um, so a lot of people are enjoying uh, not only the way you presented, Marcy, but also the resource, yeah. and they're really looking forward to it. I'd like to mention one other thing about the cards. They're a starting place. Um, feel free, if you get the cards, feel free to modify them according to your needs. Um, they're kind of generic stems, and they're just intended to, if, you could use them exactly as they are, but feel free to modify them um, according to your content, if that's helpful for you. I think that's a really important point. Thank you, Marcy. Can you click forward one time on the slide instead of me um, sharing my slides? If you click forward. Even more? Um, not backward, but the other way. Oh, that's it. <laughs> well, then go ahead and I will, I will share my screen. All right, let me stop sharing. <laughs> I'll, I'll share on this end. And... Okay, are you seeing my screen yet? I think so. I do. Yeah, okay. So we would like to remind you that we do have a Sidelets uh, Ed chat that's a regular Twitter chat on the first and third Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. It's a 30 minute powerful practical chat that you can join us on, hashtag Sidelets Ed chat. And in addition to that, we also have a blog where we frequently ask guest writers to write on as well as some of our Sidelets education consultants. So please join us on that as well. Some upcoming offerings that you can um, also learn, learn and collaborate with us on are coming up uh, this Wednesday, May 6th, we have Patricia Morales who is sharing what is the Texas 190 BTLPT Spanish? And she'll be sharing that in English for those of you who'd like to come and learn about um, that presentation. And then on May 11th, we have Carol Salva who will be presenting on supporting SLIFE during distance learning. So feel free to join us on those two upcoming webinars. And I did wanna share with you also that we have some other upcoming offerings as well. And you can find out more information about all of these offerings on our Sidelets Education webpage in the upcoming offerings tab. But there's so much we have going on and we'd love for you to join us on these different venues. Thank you all for your time today and we appreciate all that you're doing. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week if you're watching live with us and if you're watching and recording, we appreciate all that you do, even if it's not Teacher Appreciation Week. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.